as Phil said, this is the anniversary of C.S. Lewis's birth. Six years ago, he, di he died on just a week before his birth, on the 22nd of November, 1963. Now, it's fascinating, actually. I'm, I'm glad to see so many people are here. There are far, far more people here than were at C.S. Lewis's funeral. Fewer than 20 attended, because he is far, far better known now than he was then. The other thing was, of course, that on that day, on that Friday, 22nd of November, 1963, President J.F. Kennedy of America was assassinated. And that completely dominated the news coverage for that weekend. And also, it was long, long before the world of um, social media. So he's much better known now than then. And he had a very remarkable life. Not remarkable because it was full of exciting incidents, although we'll mention some things, but more so because of what he said, because of what he wrote, because of the kind of man he was. And that's going to be our emphasis. And if you've got the handout here, this is the kind of, this is the race set before us, so to speak. So first of all, his early days, 1898 to about... 1905. He was born in Belfast. His father was a lawyer, his mother a daughter of a Church of Ireland minister, and the granddaughter of a bishop. So he had very strong Christian background. He was called Clive Staple Lewis. But at a very early age, he insisted, my name is Jack. Now, many children have insisted that their names are different from what they are, but in, but in Lewis's case, this persisted. And what I regard as the best biography of Lewis by George Sayer is called Jack, A Life of C.S. Lewis. Most of his friends called him Jack, and in, in the circles in which he moved, frequently he was simply called Jack Lewis. So that's the, that's the reason for that. Now, he had an older brother called Warren, usually called Warney, and they were very close. For the first few years of his life, everything was stable and secure. And then one night, he got up with toothache and cried for his mother. He was eight at that time, and she didn't come. He discovered that the house was full of people. There were doctors in his mother's bedroom, and she died that evening of cancer. And the whole secure world of his childhood disappeared then, never to return. And that obviously affected him profoundly through the rest of his life. Now, just a word or two about his education and, and professional life. He was very, very unhappy at both his schools, both primary and secondary. His father just could not cope with the loss of his wife, and he sent both the boys to school in England. And Lewis describes in his, in his, excuse me, in his letters and in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, how awful life at school was. The headmaster, he said, was a sadist, and that was probably true. And School life consisted of bullying, of discomfort, awful food, pretty primitive living conditions. And the same happened when he went to Mulvern, the secondary school, which he calls Wyvern in his, in, in his memoirs. And then in 1914, his father sent him to Surrey for private tuition by a man called William Colpatrick whom Lewis refers to as the Great Knock. He was a very, very accomplished teacher, very learned, very articulate, but he was also an atheist, and under his influence, the young lad became an atheist. So that was that's significant to remember. Lewis, Lewis for a, long, a large part of his early life, was an atheist, and fairly militant one, just as he became a militant defender of the faith. So in his early days, he was a militant atheist. But he loved reading. 
and his imagination developed powerfully. He loved, he, he particularly loved myth, but he loved the Norse myths, he loved Greek myths and so on. And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit later about myth, because myth was very important in his thinking. And in 1916, he was awarded a scholarship for University College that, of course, was interrupted by First World War, and he went, he had to go and fight. And he was wounded and invalided out of the trenches. But once again, this was a powerful experience. The, you know, the, what, the, the, terrible, the terrible experience in the trenches in the First World War profoundly influenced his thinking about the world, about life in general. Now, on graduating, he was awarded a fellowship at Maudlin. That's how this word, this word though it looks like Magd Magdalene, is actually pronounced Maudlin College. And that was his home until 1954. We'll, we'll come back to that when he became professor of medieval and renaissance literature at Cambridge. And during these years, of course, he was continuing to think about life, about theology, and so on. And he describes himself as the most reluctant convert in England. In his book, Surprised by Joy, he describes it. Now, his conversion was a gradual one. Now, I was brought up in circles where I was told that conversion had to be dramatic and instantaneous. Now, that does happen. But it doesn't tend to happen unless you have had a very dramatic anti-Christian life before it. Um, the model was the Damascus Road, forgetting that most conversions don't follow that pattern. And it was Lewis himself who many years later said, when were Peter and John converted? Well, they converted, first of all, when this young man came along and said, follow me. Well, were they not converted until Peter's great confession, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God? But in any case, his conversion was gradual. And one night in September 1931, he entertained his friend G.R.R. Tolkien to dinner at Maudlin, and they went for a long walk after that. And at the end of the walk, as they returned, he was convinced of the reality of Christ, and of salvation, the most, as he says, the most reluctant convert in England. Now, that is a very sketchy um, outline. I, I recommend this book, Jack, A Life of C.S. Lewis. I've mentioned it at the end of the handout. A man called George Sayre. Now, Sayre was, first of all, a student of, um, a student of Lewis, later on a great friend who entertained Lewis at his home. And he, he, was, he was also an English teacher, at, actually became English teacher at Malvern, Lewis's old school, and became head of the English department there. And Sayer just died a few years ago, well on in his 90s. But he really understands Lewis, it seems to me. He gets into him in a way that many of the other biographies don't. There are, but if you... If you do get this one, make sure you get the second edition, because in the second edition, um, Sayer criticizes another biography of Lewis, which had appeared by a man called Ian Wilson, which while it, that biography, while it recognizes Lewis's greatness, he actually tries to discredit him in many ways. And it's very important that we, that you, you, you read what, a man who knew Lewis well right up to his death says about him. In fact, Sayer was one of the very few people who attended Lewis's funeral. So what I want to do now is to look at some of the issues that were particularly important for him. First of all, friendship was enormously important to Lewis. One of his books is called The Four Loves, and one of these loves is friendship. You know, the, the kind of genuine meeting of minds, meeting of interest which friends have. 
And in particular, there's a group of, a group of men called the Inklings, who met regularly on Thursday evenings in Maudlin in Lewis's, in Lewis's rooms. It wasn't a formal group. It wasn't a society with rules and agendas and officers and so on. It was a group of men who met. And what happened there, more often than not, was that the, they would read what they were they read aloud what they were writing at that moment. G.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings had its first um, public airing at these meetings, and the Narnia stories did um, as well. Tolkien didn't like the Narnia stories. He felt they were a hodgepodge, and, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But anyway, the various people who met there would read their work aloud, and then the others would criticize it. And by criticize, it was neither, they, they neither were uncritically accepting nor, nor simply dismissive. They genuinely were interested in each other's work. And they were, as I said, Tolkien, who was professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford. He was a conservative Roman Catholic. And other, other people, Hugo Dyson, Owen Barfield, Devil Coghill, Charles Williams, and Lewis's brother, Warney Lewis. They also met on Mondays and Tuesday lunchtime sometimes at the Eagle and Child, known in Oxford usually as the Bird and the Baby. So this group of people were encouraging each other to stand firm for Christian truth in a world which was ex extremely... Um, hostile to it. And indeed, um, Lewis, of course, Wokery had never been heard of in Lewis's time, but he certainly opposed it in the terms which it appeared, particularly in Out of the Silent Planet, where Ransom, the, the Oxford Don there, is partly a self-portrait. Lewis believed that there was too much influence wielded by little self-elected cliques of people who wanted to suppress any opinions other than their own. Now that sounds totally familiar nowadays, doesn't it? And it shows, you know, this, this isn't something that's just been happening in the last few years, and Lewis still dealt with it. Now, Obviously, there's so much else I could say. He married very late in life. He married a woman called Joy Gresham, an American, in 1956. He said, I didn't expect in my, in my late 50s to have the happiness that bypassed me in my 20s. And she, it was a very short marriage. She died of cancer in 1959. What made it particularly poignant was that 18 months before that, when she was first diagnosed with cancer, um, someone laid hands on her and prayed, and the cancer went into remission. And Lewis reflected on that was a particularly cruel blow in a sense, having, you know, having got it and having got rid of it, and then for it to return. And that is expressed in his book, A Grief Observed, published only after his death. A Grief Observed is a lament psalm, like the lament psalms in the Bible. There is no attempt to try and tone down the grief. Indeed, at one point, he calls God the cosmic sadist. Well, after all, I mean, that's very like the words of Jeremiah, you deceived me, Lord. And I was deceived. The psalmist in the lament, the psalmist in the lament psalms, which have not been edited out of the Bible, show the agony. It's a cry of agony. So <clears throat> you should read it. It's a painful book to read, a short book, but it's something that if you want really to enter into Lewis's experience, it's certainly, it's certainly worth reading. It's interesting, a few years earlier, he had published a book called The Problem of Pain, which of course dealt with suffering, particularly undeserved suffering. Now, that's a good book. It says many useful things. But a grief observed is an anatomy of pain and suffering uh, in, a, in a way that um, 
in a way that the problem of pain isn't. So these friendships are so important. In a hostile environment, these men encourage each other and, and help each other to keep going. Although they disagree on many things, and as I said, Tolkien did not enjoy the Narnia stories. But probably it's to, as an apologist that we need to think about him. Now, we all lot to a man called Walter Hooper. Walter Hooper was an American who actually came to Oxford in the later years of Lewis's life, hoping to get to know him and to study his work. And indeed, if Lewis had lived longer, Hooper would have become his secretary. And we owe it to him for preserving many of the talks and essays. Lewis was not good at keep holding on to the thing, to his material. When he'd done a talk, he would just bin it in the waste paper bin. And Hooper systematically searched the waste paper bins in the kilns, such as Lewis's house in Oxford, and uncovered many an essay, many a talk, which would otherwise have been lost. So we owe him a great, a great debt for that. I think Hooper himself is dead now. I think he died fairly recently. But um, he produced many, many uh, little booklets that we know. And books such as Mere Christianity originated as talks for the forces in World War II. These were talks particularly given, first of all, to airmen and radio talks. And an important talk, Ferns, Seeds and Elephants, well, that was Walter Hooper's title, defends orthodoxy against unbelieving criticism. Those of you who are interested in theology, which I hope is all of you, ought to read that essay. He's particularly talking about New Testament criticism. But what he says is even, is even more relevant, if possible, to Old Testament criticism. His argument is, that these men who are criticizing, say, the Gospels, had no idea about literary genre. They had no idea about the kind of writing the Gospels were, or the kind of writing that, say, biblical narrative was. And therefore, they were incapable of understanding what, what, what was being said. Lewis believed the Bible was supreme literature it was never it was more than literature but it was never less and i think that's hugely important i first of all discovered lewis as a literary critic long before i knew about him as anything else it was when i was studying english at st andrews uh, back in the day as they say nowadays i came across this wonderful little book um, a preface to paradise lost which, uh, which is, I mean, I don't know if any of you study English or not, but that's a very, very worthwhile little book in which he defends Milton's poem against its detractors by showing the kind of genre it is and the kind of, the kind of points that are being made. The Bible, I say, is more than literature, but never less. And if you try and read, say, something like the Song of Songs, as if it were the letter to the Romans, you're going to make terrible shipwreck of both, of both books. He also wrote important essays on prayer. One of the problems, actually, is that, as I say, so many of these were occasional essays. But recently, this book, How to Pray, was published, Reflections and Essays on, on Prayer. And... This deals with, let me read you some of the headings of the chapters. Why make requests if God already knows what we need? Do our prayers depend on how deeply we mean them? How does prayer fit in with the idea of God's providence? You know, the kind of questions that many people ask. Um, what are tips for avoiding God and prayer altogether? The devil's perspective. First of all, make sure your prayers are especially spiritual. Believe you are not a very good Christian. Treat prayers as tests of God. Focus on your own state of mind. How can we get out of our own way and pray? 
Now, you see, this book is published by, by Collins, and it was published just a few years ago, and it brings together many of Lewis's um, essays and talks on prayer. Now, one of the big problems in Lewis's life was in spite of his tremendous scholarly gifts, in spite of his the heavyweight academic books he wrote, he never became a professor in Oxford. <clears throat> Number of reasons for that. One is that <laughs> many of his colleagues couldn't bear the thought of someone in the English department writing theology. He had no right to do that. <coughs> and particularly no right to do that since people enjoyed reading it. And various opportunities came for him to get a chair, but it never, it never worked out. The other reason was, and I hate to say this, it was because he was a far, far better lecturer than most of his colleagues were. His colleagues didn't like the fact that he could fill the largest lecture halls in Oxford, including many students who are not studying English. Well, that's never a, a route to popularity. And he was regarded as an outstanding lecturer. He gave information, but he didn't just give information, he gave it in a dramatic and involved way. <clears throat> Interestingly, Tolkien was not regarded as a good lecturer, but his lectures were well attended because apparently he was a, absolutely brilliant at reading poetry, particularly old English poetry. And people loved going to hear him read certain works like Beowulf and so on. So they were both, um, they both admired each other's work. And Tolkien did his best, used his influence to get Lewis a chair. But it was eventually Cambridge who gave him a chair in 1954 when he became professor of medieval and Renaissance literature. <clears throat> and once again, he was in Magdalen College in Cambridge. That's the one, that one doesn't have an E on the end of it. So as an apologist and as a teacher, he was, he was outstanding. Now, over the page, one particular interest of his was in the influence of the devil and the through tape letters. Now, this is a very old book. Um, and it cost, it cost three and six. Some of the older people will know what that means. <laughs> Actually, that means it was less than 20p. But I want to read to you I want to read to you a little bit of this. The Strutic letters are letters which are written, which are written from a senior devil um, called Strutic to his, to his nephew, Wormwood. And Strutic is effectively, effectively acting as mentor, telling him how to tempt what he calls his patient who is a particular human being to whom a wormwood has been assigned. And <clears throat> in one of the letters, he says, you tell me your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? All virtues matter less once the man is aware that he has them, but it is especially true of humility. Catch him at the moment when he is, when he is trying to be humble and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection, I am humble. And almost immediately, pride, pride at his own humility will appear. <clears throat> if he wakes to this danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of his attempt and so on, through as many stages as you please. You must conceal the real end of humility. <clears throat> Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, but as a certain kind of opinion, a low opinion of his own talents and character. 
Some talents I gather he really has. Fix in his mind the idea that humility consists in trying to believe that he doesn't have these talents. By this method, thousands of humans has been brought to think that humility means pretty women trying to believe they are ugly and clever men trying to believe they are fools. And since what they are trying to believe is manifest nonsense, they cannot succeed in believing it. And we have the chance of keeping their minds endlessly revolving around themselves to anticipate the enemy's strategy. The enemy, of course, is God. We, we, would, we must consider his aims. The enemy wants to bring a man to the state of mind in which he could design the best building in the world, know it to be the best, and rejoice in the fact without being any more or any, any less glad at having done it than he would have been if it had been done by someone else. Now, that's very profound, isn't it? Because I'm sure many of us recognize, recognize <clears throat> what he's getting at. And in this book, that's, that's the great value of this book. Lewis notes perfectly well that the devil can operate on all kinds of levels. The obvious level, I suppose, is things like spiritism and black magic and all the rest of it. But that's not the main way he works. The main way he works is by deceiving, as the, as the Bible tells us. When he speaks, well, he's a liar. And when he lies, he speaks his native language. And that's what Lewis is getting at, which is why he's showing us the devil works most effectively when we think that we are most um, doing God's work. As at one point, Strutich says, we never tempt so successfully as at the foot of the altar. I think that's so important to realize. <clears throat> and he neither encourages excessive interest in the devil and demons or unbelief. So there's just so many of these things and we I'd be tempted to read more, but I think we've done enough because I want now to get to further up and further in. He is best known, of course, for the Narnia stories. It's, it's astonishing, actually. An unmarried man in his 50s with hardly any experience of children, wrote stories that delighted and still delight children. A few years ago, one of my granddaughters, when the family were on holiday, discovered in the holiday cottage something she had never come across before, an old-fashioned wardrobe. And immediately she was inside it, hoping like Lucy to find Narnia. up. Now, <clears throat> That's the, and these little books for which he's probably best known, and of course the films as well. I hear that Netflix are thinking of, of um, doing all the books, which would be good. Uh, some of you will have seen some of the films, I imagine. Now, what I want to try and ask answers the question, why are they so popular? Now, that's extremely difficult to do. And <clears throat> I want to suggest three reasons. First of all, they are great stories, and we must enjoy them as such. It's perfectly possible to read the Narnia stories simply as stories and not go any deeper, and some people have done that. And Lewis himself was aware of that, and he said, it, if you stimulate people's imagination, you can smuggle in all kinds of theology without them being aware of it. And that's, that's very true. They are great stories, exciting stories. For example, the, in the line, The Witch and the Wardrobe, when the White Witch and Aslan's friends trying to outpace each other. I'm afraid, it's getting warmer now, but I'm afraid tonight this room was more like the White Witch's land than like than like Aslan's spring. And then in my favorite um, Narnia book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Lucy's long and nervous walk through the corridors of a large and mysterious house. 
that she uncovers a book which um, leads on to the next stage of the story. <clears throat> I read the Narnia stories every year. In fact, I read them, I reread them recently in preparing for this. So I'm looking forward again to, to, to reading them at Advent, because every Advent I read them, and I read all of them. If you've only read The Lion, the Witch, and the Ward, or read all of them, begin with The Magician's Nephew, and go through to the, to the Last Battle. It's a wonderful experience. Tremendous stories, well told. The second thing is vivid settings, the sense of place, the realism. And I think this is where Lewis is so good. The, the, inscription, the descriptions are realistic. And yet, there is suggestion of hidden wonders all the time. This is no Shadowlands. This is the real world. God likes matter, said Lewis. He made it. And when we read the descriptions of Aslan's land, they're not. It's not a kind of. It's not a kind of shadowy existence, wearing ethereal negligees and floating on clouds, strumming harps. It's a wonderful country, a deeper country, further up and further in. And the third thing is they are full of theological nuggets. I want to mention one or two of them just now. Okay. <coughs> First of all, in the, the magician's nephew, which is the full story. This is where this is where Aslan creates Narnia. He sings it into existence, and <clears throat> and it's hardly created when when evil comes into it. And uh, do not be cast down," said Aslan. "Evil will come of that evil, but it is still a long way off." and I will see to it that the worst of it falls upon myself. And as Adam's race has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to heal it. Wonderful theological nugget, as I say. And then in, in the line, the witch and the wardrobe, when the children return through the wardrobe, fascinating they are away for many years in Narnian time and grow into, into men and women. But when they return to the, through the wardrobe in, in the professor's house, they're exactly the same age. It's exactly the same time. That in itself is a fascinating um, angle on how time may be different in different worlds. And they talk to... Professor Kirk. And the professor, who was a very remarkable man, didn't tell them not to be silly or not to tell lies, but believe the whole story. No, he said, don't try and go back through the wardrobe door. You won't get into Narnia by that route. Of course you'll get to Narnia again someday. Once a king in Narnia always a king in Narnia. And don't mention it to anyone else unless you find that they've had adventures of the same sort itself. How will you know? Oh, you'll know all right, odd things they see, even their looks. Keep your eyes open. So, once again, this sense of the travel between different worlds and the sense of the wonder of the whole of creation. Now, <clears throat> you see, once again, in the, in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, it, <clears throat> where Lucy is, first of all, in despair, when Aslan says to her, you're too old, you can't come back into the, in, you can't come back into Narnia now. <clears throat> but shall we meet again, says Lucy. Oh, yes, we shall. We shall meet in my own country, but there I have another name. That was the very reason why you brought we were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, 
you know me better there. Wonderful. And, uh, final, and no, not finally, penultimately, in the silver chair, Huddle Glom the Marsh Wiggle. Wonderful character. Um, <clears throat> you know, he complains about everything, um, says he isn't going to do anything and doesn't. And then when the, when the witch is telling them there is no upper land, this is all the world there is, Puddle Glum says, well, I'm going to live as a Narnian even if there isn't any Narnia. And I'm on Aslan's side even if there isn't any Aslan. You see the, you see the point that... <clears throat> that he's entered deeply into, into the reality of who Aslan is. And finally, in the last battle, in the stable, which like calm Doctor Who's TARDIS is bigger inside than outside, Lucy said, once in our country, there was a stable that had something in it that was bigger than the whole world. The mystery and wonder of the incarnation something that was bigger than the whole world. <clears throat> and I want to read now as we are as we are coming to the end um, <clears throat> where Aslan's friends are at last gathered up into Aslan's country. When I was a boy I didn't want to go to heaven because I was told it was like being in church. Now, if you tell an eight-year-old boy that, that's not likely to encourage him, or an eight-year-old girl for that matter, to want to go to heaven. And then, when I read, when I read the, in the last battle, the sheer physicality, the beauty, the wonder of this deeper country, and it was the unicorn who said, the reason we loved the old Narnia was that sometimes it looked like this. All that is beautiful and good in this creation, art, music, other things, free of sin, free of selfishness, free of devilry, will be there fully in Aslan's country. And Lucy said, this is still Narnia, and more beautiful than the Narnia down below. Yes, said Mr. Tumnus, like an onion, except as you go in, each circle is larger than the last. Why, exclaimed Peter, there's the old house, Professor Kitch's old house, in the country where all our adventures began. I thought that house had been destroyed, said Edmund. So it was, said the fawn, but you are now looking at the real Narnia, which cannot be destroyed. Suddenly they shifted their eyes to another spot. Then Peter and Edmund and Lucy gasped with amazement and shouted out and began waving. For there they saw their own father and mother waving back at them across the great deep valley. <clears throat> How can we get at them, said Lucy. That's easy, said Mr. Thomas. That country and this country, all the real countries, are only spars jutting out from the great mountains of Aslan. We have only to walk on the ridge, upward and inward, till it joins on. And soon they found themselves all walking together, and a great bright procession it was. Up to mountains higher than you could see in this world, but there was no snow on these mountains. There were forests and green slopes and sweet orchards and flashing waterfalls, one above the other, going on forever. <clears throat> and the land they were walking on grew narrower all the time. And that land, which was Aslan's land, grew nearer and nearer. And then Lucy forgot everything else because Aslan himself was coming, leaping down from cliff to cliff like a living cataract of power and beauty. And the very first person whom Aslan called him was Puzzle the Donkey. 
You never saw a donkey look sillier than puzzled it as he walked up to Aslan. Then the lion bowed down his head and whispered something to Puzzle, which his long ears went, went down, but he said something else. Then Aslan turned to them and said, You don't look as happy as I thought you would be. <coughs> Lucy said, We are so afraid of being sent away. Aslan, you have sent us back into our own world so often. No fear of that, said Aslan. Have you not guessed their hearts leaped and a wild hope leapt within them? There was a real railway accident, Aslan said softly. Your father and mother and all of you are, as you used to call it, in the Shadowlands, dead. The term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. That's all the Narnia stories. We can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. That's absolutely wonderful. That's what the new... That's, now, Lewis isn't saying that's exactly what the new creation will be like. He's imaginatively, poetically showing something of the wonder of the Creator. Because remember, the cre God, when God made heaven and earth, he made it good, he hasn't changed his mind, and he is going to renew it. Now, <clears throat> just, as we, just as we finish, I just want to say something about, um, I put some books at the end. The Narnia stories, there are many editions such as this full one, but there are many. Then the screw tape letters, as I say, mine is, 19, mine is dated 1964. Then there is this one, How to Pray. And then there is Jack, A Life of C.S. Lewis. There's an awful lot more, particularly in America, there's a C.S. Lewis industry. And... <laughs> books and 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 then if you go on <clears throat> if you go on on google of course there's a there's many cs there's one called through the wardrobe which is which is very good and there are many there are many talks many films and so on as well as um essays and, and books well thank you very much um and read him